Hey, today I'm speaking to Moon Ribas and Manel de Aguas, two cyborg artists. What is a cyborg artist, you might ask? Well, both Moon and Manel implant the technologies to their bodies to allow themselves to experience the world differently and extend their senses. We will hear about the technologies they implanted, how their surroundings and society in general responded to their decision. Wait until you hear about Manel's technology. What are they doing in their cyborg lab and why they find it important to defend the right to self-design? All and more in this episode. Stay tuned. It is an exciting one. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology, and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey, podcast listeners. Thanks again for coming back for another episode of the Artian. Today, we have two unique speakers. They are a representation of the potential of combining art technology and our human body. They are Moon Ribas and Manel de Aguas. Hey guys, welcome. Hello. Hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking the time to share your exciting work that you are doing. And in a second, obviously, we will dive deep. And maybe we will start with a short uh, intro. Maybe you can tell us about yourself, Moon. Hello, I'm Moon, and I'm an artist, uh, well, a cyborg artist from Barcelona. Hello, I'm Manel de Aguas, and I'm from Barcelona, also cyborg artist, exploring the surroundings. <laughs> okay, we'll get to it in a second. Both of you mentioned that you are cyborg. I'm wondering, what is a cyborg? To me, to be a cyborg is to understand technology as part of your identity. But there's other cases. It could be also like to be a cyborg in terms of biology. It's like to have body parts or technology uh, in part of like inside your body, let's say. And I wonder what is the difference maybe between cyborg and a cyborg art? How will you define cyborg art? For us, I think cyborg art is the... Um the creation of your own reality. So we all have senses and through those senses, we experience the, our surroundings and uh, the world that we have outside. But you, if you add new senses, this perception of the world changes. And we see this as cyborg art, the creation of new senses and new body parts that makes that create your own perception of reality. In your context, you actually start to, in a second, we will discuss what is your superpower, how do you use in technology in your body. But before that, I want to kind of tackle one definition in order for me and the listeners to understand. You differentiate between installed technology to implanted technology. What is the difference? So, yeah, there's a difference between uh, installed technology and implanted technology. The installed technology is that one that is attached to the body uh, without the need of a surgery, basically. And it's, for example, the case of the people that is creating the, the first prototypes of the new body parts. So in my case, I've been the last three years with uh, prototypes like installed in the body, not directly implanted. And in the case of implantable technologies, that one that needs like a surgery method to get it in. So you basically, I don't know how you do it, but you install technology or do a surgery to install technology into your body. Is that correct? That's correct. So basically people cannot see you, but we will share the, your picture later. But you have something installed in your head, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, is it installed right. or implanted? There's an implanted part and an installed part. It's both. Okay, so you have in your head implanted technology. Basically, you did a surgery to implant it and you have something installed. Tell us about your superpower. What is the technology that you installed or implanted in your body? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think we both don't like to call it like superpowers because it is something like to make it superior to other things. And for us, it's just like creating new senses and new body parts like in the other species 
like the nature is full of species that have different senses and different organs and they are not organized in a hierarchy they're all let's say but different no so my new sense and new organ that i'm creating and i have installed right now it's like two weather fins i call them like this because they are inspired in the fins from the fishes and they are fins to perceive the weather through my bone to hear the weather basically at talking about the installing thing and the implanted thing uh, i have like a tiny part between the bone and the skin it's like a metallic part that allows me to transmit the vibrations that the fins are creating until the bone and why you chose to connect yourself into the weather in the beginning because because i, I always been <laughs> interested in the rain <laughs> And then I saw that it was possible to be more connected to the rain than I was before. So that's why I started to explore through my own body this connection. So for the listeners that now are listening but cannot see you, I will describe it. Manel has kind of a beautiful two white fins just above his head. And we will post a picture in the website so you can see how it looks. So Moon, what is your, I don't know how to call it, your cyborg uh, part? If I don't call it superpower, how shall I refer it? Yeah, no, and just to explain again with Manel, uh, lots of people think about that we united technology for getting better or like to feel like a superhero, but I actually feel very uncomfortable with these terms, as Manel said, because it's not about getting better because maybe feeling the weather or feeling earthquakes were, like I did, uh, it, it's worse for some people. So it's just a... Uh, Another experience of reality. Okay. And it doesn't mean that it's better or worse. It's like an experiment. We experiment with ourselves and our senses. Great. So first of all, I'm happy you clarify it. If you speak about your friends about cyborgs, know that it's not about superpowers. It's just about experiencing. Maybe some cyborgs are. That's why it's a very complex thing. Um, Manel and I are doing something very concrete. We United Technology do it to experience the outside world. But there's many, many ways to unite the technology. We just are one little part. There's many people that unite the technology for other reasons, and maybe they have other ideas. So I'm just uh, explaining what my idea of unite the technology, but that doesn't mean that other people don't. I mean, other cyborgs or other people that who identify with cyborgs have other reasons. So that's all. So what is your, um, how shall I refer it? Yeah, if it's not, okay. What is your no, new like sense? A new, a, new, a new sense, but now I also have a, a bit of a long story, but yeah, <laughs> what I had, what my mainly project with United with Technology and adding a new sense, it was basically almost for seven years, I had some implants in my body that were connected to online seismographs. So whenever there was some seismic activity in the planet, I would feel a vibration inside my body. So whenever there was an earthquake, I would feel a vibration in my feet. And depending on the intensity of the vibration, I knew if the earthquake was more intense or less intense. And I call this the seismic sense, the sense of feeling the seismic activity of the planet in real time. Manel chose the, started with the rain and the weather, and you choose actually earthquake and seismic activity. Why you chose seismic activity for that matter? Well, I'm a choreographer and a dancer. So while I was studying dance, I guess you all the time creating movement, but there was a point that I, I wanted to find movement. There's many things that move around us that it's not only human. Movement, it's not just a human thing. There's many things that move around us. So I wanted to start to explore movement in a deeper way. And I knew that if I unite myself with technology, I could explore this feeling of other movements and I started like perceiving what I had behind and so I did something about the speed of the people walking but then I wanted to perceive a more universal movement and I had this image where I thought okay if I would be alone in the planet how could I perceive movement if there's no no one else moving and then I realized that the earth is constantly moving not only rotates but it shakes constantly through earthquakes and I thought it would be really ex extraordinary for me like to be united to a very natural movement that it's huge and actually most of the time it's imperceptible. And I thought for me this idea just really fulfilled me to be connected to a very natural movement and, and massive but uh, that it's hidden also. So and this is when I started creating the seismic sense. And how did you get to the idea of 
cyborgism? How did you even expose? You started with this question, how can I sense the world if nobody is here? But how did you get into cyborgism? By the way, in which age it was? For me, the experiment to, with technology and movement, it started in 2007. I have to say that my closest friend is Neil Harbison. So we grew up together and he already experimented with antenna in 2004. So I was very close to him. And I think that the cyborg thing, as I think you can guess from Manel and I, I never thought about cyborgs when I was a teenager. I never even felt closer to science fiction movies or I didn't even play video games. I wasn't like close to technology at all. And I actually still feel that I, there's some of these ideas about technology that I don't relate at all and I, that I don't know. Uh, I was interested in, in art and, and nature and to experiment with it. And then I just used technology in a way to feel what, what I really like in the deepest way. So I think the term cyborg, actually, I didn't even think about it. I think that the first person who called the cyborg was a journalist. They started to call us cyborgs. And then it's when I, I started to think about this new term. And then actually the word cyborg was created by two scientists from NASA asked Nathan Klein and Manfred Klein to write an article. This was in the 60s. And they thought that we needed another word apart from bionic. And then they said, okay, if the natural way of exploring for the human species is go, well, we went to all, everywhere in the world. So the next step is to go to space. Instead of living inside the spaceships, we should modify ourselves in order to survive in other environments. And that's why they created the word cyborg, which is the modification of oneself, oneself in order to survive in space, they thought. So actually, we feel very connected to this definition because it's, we say, okay, I feel I'm a cyborg because I modify myself, not to survive in other environment, but actually to understand where I am and to understand better the planet we live in. Manel, what brought you to cyborg? If I can use the word cyborgism, what brought you? How did you get connected? Because Moon just grew up next to Neil and saw it firsthand and then used the technology as a medium for your exploration. How did you get into this world? Yeah, to me it was in 2017. I was studying photography and I was already like exploring the cyborg like scenario like in term, like through photography. And then during that days, I met Neil and Moon, and they were the ones. Well, I started like actually shoot making a photography project about them, um, mm. going with them around and shooting pictures. And yeah, they introduced me to the cyborg art movement, and I felt like super connected to this movement as well. And yeah, I just decided like to become the subject that I was photographing at that time instead of just photographing it from the outside. So become... moving behind the camera to the front of the camera, and now people yeah. take the photos of you. Yeah. It's very unique, at least those days, to kind of see people. In your case, Manel, it's much more evident because you go in the street with those fins on your head. I wonder how your surrounding responded to that. The moment you say, okay, I'm not only going to install, I'm going to do surgery, and I'm going to put or implant technology into my body. How do your surrounding friends, family respond to that? Yeah, my friends and my family, in the end, they've been there during the whole process. Um, yeah, they keep accepting it step by step. You know, it's not like suddenly the first day I'm going to implant two things in my head. Like, <laughs> yeah, every time it's just questions around them and this curiosity. But from my friends and my family, Luckily, I've had like a lot of res respect. Yeah, everything it's been fine. I think there's more problems, let's say, with the social reaction, for example, in the streets. Why? How people respond to that? Depending on the place. I mean, I live in a city. It's not that hard, let's say. But I mean, people look at all, but it's fine. I also am curious for the people and look them, you know, but it's sometimes could be a little bit more violent. And if it's a small village, maybe, maybe some people could like scream something at you, you know, it, there could be situations get a little bit violent, not yeah. physically yet, but like verbally maybe, but that's what happened a lot with the people that other circles, like queer people or 
you know, like in the end, it's diversity, the accepting of diversity. And maybe in the cities, it gets easier or maybe not, you know, depending on the place. Yes, yeah, so your experience is mixed. Friends and family slowly get it or accept yeah. it and the surrounding is depends. Yeah, I think, you know, as human beings, normally we tend to kind of uh, reject what we are not familiar with and seeing this kind of create probably this antagonism about what those guys are doing. Moon, how was the experience for you? The implant is the last thing of the process. First, uh, you think about the, what you want to feel, then you find the technology that first uh, you try it outside, and then the last step is to, to implant. So it's actually a long and a slow process. I guess my family, when actually support, support, I don't know, there's, uh, it's a bit like they think that I do weird things. <laughs> and it's like, oh, now you do this, okay, well... Uh, whatever it is <laughs> just saying that i did like contemporary art it's already we, they, they do art they're very quite an artistic family but uh, a bit more classical you know like classic theater so when i do they always cut, cut, label me with a uh, weird uh, art thing <laughs> so this is part of the pack and yeah i don't know some friends connected more with the idea and some friends mm, they don't connect that much it's very different from Manel or Neil because uh, their new sense, it's, they sense something that is very close, so they, they have it outside. Because mine is connected to internet, so I don't need to have an external organ, external body part. So I, I don't have all this social interaction, this involuntary social interaction that sometimes I, because growing up with Neil, I could see a lot. And I think it's, it's actually very hard and, I remember sometimes Neil said, oh, have it with an antenna. I'm like, no, no way. I mean, it, it brings them a lot of good things because I think they meet people that I would never meet. Or, and this is the nice thing, but they, there's also like, they can be admired in one street and then laughed about, uh, at it in the next one. It's, I think it, it's hard. It's hard to have this yeah. external organ. People usually, yeah, when, when it's something that they don't know, people tend to laugh or reject it, as you said it. So for the listener, they don't know, Neil is the third uh, member of the Trans Species Society, which we will talk in a second. And he has actually a camera that connected him to his head that allows him to actually hear colors. In a way, you are pioneers in the work that you are doing. And I wonder from your experiences as an artist, what do you think is the role of the artist in society? I have different answers. I think artists are... I guess uh, artwork usually uh, expresses the point of view of the artist, of how it's a reflection of how you see, what you think, how you understand the world. That's why I think in, to have a new sense, it, it's normal that our art is it's about this because it's, it's the peculiarity about how we experience the world. And I think usually when we, especially many years ago, technology was used for very practical reasons, but not for experiments. So people really accept that it was there for medical reasons or just like to be very functional. People, society accepts that we can use technology in this way, but then to experiment and to do art, then some people, I think now people are starting to accept it, but 15 years ago, everyone was like, but why, why not? It's just like, it, it feels that if you united technology, it has to be a very functional reason. And it's just to experience the world. And then when you like, have this experience, then maybe you, you, can, you can think differently also. And specifically for my, my artwork, which is like feeling the earthquakes, it's about listening how alive our earth is. And sometimes we build and we live our life forgetting actually how our planet is. So in my art pieces I, I try to maybe have this moment give the audience this moment of just to stop and, and listen when we hosted you here in madrid for the startup conference after your talk we had conversation you mentioned kind of a philosophical aspect of it that you said that if we feel what we are doing to earth maybe we will even respond differently and i remember that that's something that kind of resonates with me a lot especially i think in today's situation when everyone speak about climate crisis, but not a lot of people actually are doing something about it. 
So maybe, you know, using kind of those experiences that you give us, feeling what we are doing can touch different. Yeah, and, and I think Manel will also think that, but it's also uh, creating uh, empathy, you know? Like if you, if you feel closer, if you understand better where you are, I guess you will behave differently because you will have more empathy. I feel like that's why we keep saying that we do art, so we are allowed to experiment and, and, and make questions. I think artists and philosophers are the ones who can make questions and, and not to give answers because we're not functional. It's about the experience and, and questioning where, where we are. The other, other people give answers. <laughs> I think it's important also to question yourself. I totally agree. I think what I like about artists is that artists lead with questions. Before we will uh, hear the role of the artist from Manel perspective, let's take a short break. Would you like to work personally with Nier to develop and grow your artistic mindset? At the Artian, we work with organizations and individuals to achieve greater success. Through our art-based leadership sales and innovation training, we show organizations that there is another way of thinking and another possibility of acting. Visit us at www.theartian.com. That is T-H-E-A-R-T-I-A-N.com to learn more. Thank you again for coming back. I'm speaking with Moon and Manel, two cyborgs, about how technology influences their senses or expands their senses. And just before the break, I asked Moon about the role of the artist. And now, Manel, I'm interested to hear your perspective. What do you think is the role of the artist, or at least what you are trying to do with your work? Um, the role of the artist is to make questions, not uh, put different topics on the table to discuss through your own artworks. I think when you create like an artwork, uh, you are creating something like physically and making it like real. So it's something that you can discuss about it. No, you can create, there's a panel around sometimes. And uh, art sometimes is uh, transgressive, no? And it, that's what creates more questions and different opinions in the people. But that's the interesting point, I think. When there's like this kind of discussion is because there's minds thinking, no? And that's what makes the, the evolution of society in a way. So I think that art has like this super important role of that society evolves through the art or art is the reflection of the, the evolution of the society, you know, both in both ways. And you insisted about the fact that your sense is not about making you better in the, I would say, the hierarchy in the, of nature, but rather yeah. create something else. And you refer to it as horizontal hierarchy. What do you mean? Yeah, what I mean is that all these pieces are there's no vertical hierarchy where the human species are better than the other ones, no? That's what we see in our current society. We are eating a lot of animals day by day and we're killing them actually for our consume, no? And like there's a big point of view in society about like this hierarchy of species where some of them are under the regimen or of others, no? So yeah, basically that's what it means to me to see nature in an horizontal line, to see that we all deserve the same respect than, and not less than others, you know? And that's what happened, I think, after like getting inspired by nature and other animals and like adding to your body, body parts that are inspired in that, that animals, for example, because you kind of get closer to them, you know? You get more identified by them and that's when you realize you're becoming something different that was you one before so that's as i see myself as and more i think like trans species no we also call this as a trans species movement because we are kind of breaking the walls of our human identity and we started to feel less human than before or discovering a part inside us that doesn't represent it's not uh, directly represented by the human identity, you know, by out of the human walls, let's say. And that feeling, it also gets you closer to the other species because you understand that you are a different species among the, the others, you know, but you're not better and you're not less than the others. So if you deserve this respect in this diversity, everyone deserves it. So nature is horizontal. Everyone deserves the respect. And I think that is the... the um, a good way to, to see it. 
Yeah, and maybe the moment we will adopt this kind of point of view, maybe we will treat nature differently. I want to maybe ask a bit about the type of the different works that you did. And uh, I want to ask you, Moon, about the work that you had with people walking and then it's kind of involved the data and new knowledge. And can you tell us about this project a bit? Yeah, I, actually, this was the, I think the first project that I ever did uniting with technology. I had a type of earrings that allow me to know the speed of the people walking in front of me. So if someone was walking from right to left, I would feel a vibration on my right ear and then on my left ear. And depending on the interval of each vibration, I would know the speed of the people. Doing this, I realized that actually we as a, a society, like a common body that walks, we tend to change our speed depending on the people that we have around. So unconsciously, you would probably walk faster if you are in London than if you are in Rome, because there's a, a common tendency. And I was uh, really fascinated by that. So I started a project of defining each capital city of Europe by the speed of the citizens. Who was the fastest? Uh, L- London. London is very <laughs> fast. Stockholm was very fast too. Who was the slowest? Also, And the slowest was the Vatican City. Okay. Like the slowest. <laughs> yeah, it's basically a, a very long queue, <laughs> okay. a line of people waiting. Did, did it give you a new realization and new insights about our society from this project? Yeah, like this common movement sense. I think, I think it's, I found it like kind of beautiful that we, without even noticing, we tend to relate to each other unconsciously through movement. And that's why that I had this need of, of creating this movement dictionary that I could. And also I like the idea of defining cities in another way. Usually we don't talk about the, the movement of the cities. It was like another, another layer to add in, a, yeah, in the cities. It sounds like technologies that James Bond will have, you know, kind of feeling how people move around him, etc. So it's very interesting to kind of experience it. And you had another project that was involving having kind of teeth, no? That you did with Neil. What is this project? That was an experiment also that we did. We were invited to Mesa en Carrera in, in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And we spent uh, a week. We, we had 15 people that we could do a project together. Uh, so we spent there uh, a week. I, I have a, a tooth missing and Neil had two teeth missing. So we, we thought that maybe we could design a tooth that we could <laughs> communicate to each other with this tooth. So a prototype was implanted in, or was, no, not implanted, but like put it in my mouth. And then another one was put it in, in Neil's mouth. And whenever I click, I press my teeth, he would feel a vibration. Whenever he, he clicked with his teeth, I would feel a vibration. Both learned the, the Morse code a long time ago for, for a performance. So we were actually able to communicate from tooth to tooth by clicking <laughs> our mouth. Amazing. And, uh, and, and the funny thing also is, was that uh, actually it, was, uh, it worked with Bluetooth. So it was a Bluetooth tooth for, for real. Nice, nice. So I love it. <laughs> New ways of communicating. Actually, taken from the past, the Morse code, uh, which, by the way, I don't know if people know, but Morse itself, Samuel Morse was a painter before he invented actually the Morse code and the electrical telegraph. So that's another, oh, really? I think, an example mm. for artists that actually start from art and going into technology. So, yeah. I think about this using of technology is, I find it quite natural. For me, it's not that it's, Real. I mean, we are in 20s and 20s and we are surrounded with technology. So I think it's natural for artists to use the tools that we have around to, to create, like, to experiment. Uh, I probably if I would be born 100 years ago, yeah, I would do art, but in a very di- uh, different way. So I, I guess it's part of the times that we live in to create this way. Yeah, I think you're touching exactly one of the points. Again, this mystification of art. People think, again, that artists only work with painting. And I always say artists are living in the same time as we are. And they're experimenting with everything that is available, whether it is technology, biology, science, or whatever it's available. Manel, what are the projects that you are working on now? Right now, I'm starting to design the next weather fins. 
because my aim is to make them lighter and smaller. And also I want to do some changes with the Wi-Fi connection because my aim is also to be able to connect myself to other uh, weather stations in the world without having to be there. So I could be hearing how's the rain arriving to Tokyo from my room in Barcelona. And yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm looking at those fin that you have and I'm wondering, will it be available for someone to buy it at a certain point if I want to install those fin in my head? Um, not yet, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it, like, it takes a lot of time uh, to recreate just one pair of fins and I'm working it as an art project. I don't know. I'm not thinking it of a product yet, but yeah, who knows? And one of the things that you also did, uh, did both of you, uh, Moon and Manelli, together with Neil, is that you started actually a cyborg lab. And when I read the mission of the cyborg lab, and in a second I will read it to our listeners, I was amazed. It sounds, when you read it in a way, it kind of sounds something futuristic that I will read in a maybe science fiction book, but you actually are doing it in the day to day. What is the purpose of this lab? I guess it's like the. The aims of the Cyborg Foundation, no? we, we basically have three aims. One is to help people to become a cyborg, to, to create new senses and new body parts to extend their perception. The other one is to promote cyborg art as an artistic movement. And the other one is to defend cyborg rights, the, the right and the freedom that everyone should have to be able to design how they want to be and what senses and body parts do they want to have. I want to ask you something, you know, you touched something uh, over here that I think is at least essential for me to understand. You say defend human rights to actually design their own senses. Why Why you feel that you need to do it? Well, yeah, the, the, the right of being able to, to have the freedom to decide what senses and organs you want to have. For example, yeah, to have a basic right of having this, for example, implanting new, new body parts in your body. And that if you have a new body part that you are allowed to work anywhere, to go to the cinema. For, for example, I remember many years ago that Neil wasn't allowed to cinemas because they thought that they would, he would be filming the... Really? The, yeah, cinemas or in casinos, he's not allowed. So there are many, or he, uh, some jobs he cannot have. So mm. there's some restrictions about having these new body parts because people are not used to of seeing them, I guess. And then that's the, what we said before. No, usually it's this rejection when you don't know something. So it's just like, and the right to be able to have these surgeries that they, that now it's not illegal or, or legal. It's just illegal. There's like a gap. Uh, I think we all defend the freedom of, of being able to defining yourself as you want to be and designing how you want to be. So it's also about uh, identifying as, as you want to be. And I don't know, Manel, if you want to explain this better. <laughs> when, like, did it? Yeah, no, basically that we confront many situations we are not allowed to be ourselves, you know? It's like uh, I can pass we through the airplane or securities without having to reply many questions or, you know, like dif these different situations, like I have problems to find a job, like uh, working in a bar or on a shop, these kind of things that in the end are a problem for the daily life. And the right to be free to add your new body parts is like, in a way, a way of um, to defend the, this freedom that we have, but people is not aware of it, you know? I don't know, like there's a kind of, of discrimination to that. Also it makes me think about the internet thing, no? Like that we can be hacked. And like you usually that what I said, the the rights, the also actually we started to write the Bill of Rights and there's like five rules that I don't remember all of them, but they're all online. And for example, is the right of deciding who enters your body or not. Like if you have internet in your body you are exposed to be hacked so that you can decide that not everyone can, can enter to your body. Also, for example, the new body part is treated as part of yourself. If someone is pulling Manel's thin, that it, this is uh, considered physical aggression, not like property aggression. 
you're touching very interesting points over here. I want to ask you, I mean, now that you are talking about it, suddenly it's kind of occurred to me that actually if it's you are connected to the internet, someone can hack it. I mean, what do you do? How do you actually defend it? Because you have it in your body. Uh, it hasn't happened to me, but I guess I think it would be easy. I guess someone would be, for me, it's it's not that extreme. Like, I guess someone can make it vibrate, vibrate my implant all the time, no? and then maybe I, I could disconnect it. I know Neil, Neil has been hacked once and he received um, some colors that he wasn't perceiving in that moment. But he says that he likes it, so it's not that bad. Okay. <laughs> and Manel, you mentioned the airports. How do you actually pass all the electronic security gates? Explaining them. In the end, it's like you have to have a conversation. You know? Yes? Yeah, most of the times. But I guess it helps like also as Neil has like passport, passport picture, you know, like he has, he's, he appears with his antenna. And this, in a way, it gets the things easier, you know, the situation easier. But anyway, for him, it's as well, yeah, like a, a moment, you know. <laughs> maybe sl- slowly, slowly, we will get there. People will get uh, maybe 10 years from now. It will be natural that you enter into the airplane or to the security with technology or fins in your head. So I want to go back to the foundation. What exactly are the activities that you take in this uh, foundation? It's basically based in Barcelona and you also have a space there, right? Yeah. What do you do there? Because if I remember, you also have artists in residence and you create kind of, you create events, etc. I mean, what is the purpose? Obviously, it's fulfilled the mission, but what exactly are those activities? Yeah, the main activity I would say is like the lab, that is the creation of new senses and new organs. This is the base, but in the end, like the the foundation, it's a space where we can speak and we can discuss about these topics and you can express, you're free to express this kind of identities, the cyborg, transpecies identities. It's like a safe space for these uh, identities. And how does it work? Someone has an idea, they want to design technology for their own body. I mean, how can I get into this lab? Well, basically, the lab is a combination of different people from different branches. So there's electronic designers, philosophers, artists, um, people in the health area, no? And in the end, like, we create, like, a unique subject, which is the the creation of new senses and new organs. Um, But that's exactly these different branches that that they keep the people came from uh, is what makes the projects more interesting because we all have different points of view uh, depending on which is our area, you know. And it's beautiful because it's like uh, projects that are made in a team teamwork, you know. And Um, and it's open for everyone. So every listeners that now listen, go to cyborgarts.com and then they apply and then they can enter to work with you to design their own senses. I mean, there's a kind of application, like, because in the end, it's impossible to be working in a lot of projects at the same time. The lab itself has its own projects. So, yeah, it's been changing, actually. In the beginning, it was more open, I guess, in terms of, like, taking projects from the outside. But now I think it's more focused on creating um, projects from the Cyber Foundation itself. But I think we are all, we are always open, you know, to consider and to listen the the proposals from the people around, and that's yeah what make us evolve it as well. So if you have an idea, just go to cyborgarts.com and try to reach out to the guys. We always speak about when we will be able to install technologies into our body, etc., etc., and everyone will be able to do it maybe personally. But you guys are not waiting for the future. One of the things that is incredible to me is that you are doing actually live surgery on Instagram. I saw few of them actually taking place. And while we are waiting in the, I would say, in the mainstream to the ability to do those surgery, you are actually using the social media to do those surgeries. And that's something that kind of surprised me a lot. I'm interested, do you have some exciting ideas that developed in the labs that not necessarily came from you, but came from the outside, from other people? Like, 
for example, projects that I've liked. It happened like in a workshop that we did with the university. Uh, and it was like a s spine, you know? Okay. I guess spine. There, but yeah. There's also spine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where it, that it was connected to the um, tide from a, a beach, like in Canada. Okay. For example, this with a workshop in south of France, a girl did it. That it was yeah. the tide from also. From Saint Michel, no? In, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they are very similar, no? These both, but uh, I really like it, like the way that you could feel. The, the, you, this spine was connected to the tide of the of this beach in Canada, and every time the tide came up, like you were able to feel through a hitting point how how this the tide was changing, uh, whatever you were, you know. So first of all, I'm very happy to hear that university actually invited you to create to host a workshop. It means that this young generation actually is exposed to your ideas and hopefully will take it forward maybe or join the movement of accepting this type of merging technologies with our bodies so manel you mentioned you are going to improve your uh, fins and you moon are you working on something else uh yeah actually um, i i took the the implants of the of the seismic sense out on uh, instagram again live yeah, I had to share it, no, because I had this project for almost seven years, having this. I wanted to, to, to have a, a change, a radical change, and I guess the most radical thing I thought I could do was to take them out. So this is what I did, and it was actually very, very scary because I thought that everything would change. And then that it happened to me a very weird thing because I had the implants, and then when I took them out, I could still feel the, the vibrations of the implants inside mm. me. So I had this phantom effect for, for some months. <laughs> so I was like, a, we, we joked about not that maybe I was like a phantom cyborg because I didn't have the implants, but I, I still could feel the, the next sense. And now I'm thinking uh, of a, a new sense and maybe something related to the ocean, to something that I also see, you know, like the planet is almost... Almost everything is water, but uh, we know so little about it. And actually, this this past month, uh, I've been studying to to take my like boat license mm. to know how to navigate in the undersea, and to hopefully to to know more about this, how the ocean, and then thinking how what what could I feel there. So in a way, I've been in Earth, and now I'm moving to to water. <laughs> nice. When you had it, you also moved between Earth and Moon, and that's, I think, the, mm. the real Moon that you sense, the Moon itself. And that, yeah. I think, for another even conversation, but we'll definitely yeah. make sure to add the links to uh, your different projects and profile on our uh, homepage. So you touched an interesting uh, point, and, and I want to hear maybe your thoughts on that. You actually said, okay, I had this sense for seven years, but now I can find something else. While the evolution gave us five cents that basically we can... We have them as, as a standard. With your approach, actually, we can change our senses. Manel, you think that at a certain point you also would like to change your sense or currently you are happy with the fins? I'm happy with the fins, <laughs> but I, I know I'm also a person that uh, likes to evolve a lot. But that's up in part why I really like the rain, no? Because it, rain, it's like something that to me means like the change, no? And the renewal of things. And uh, to me... You know, a way to be connected to the rain is a way to be uh, like renewing myself all the time, you know, is another way of changing uh, myself. And I don't know. I don't know if this uh, constant change uh, with the rain and my life, it will uh, make me happier <laughs> forever, you know, because I will be always changing anyway or not. Or maybe I will go for a bigger change. I don't know. <laughs> Until you get bored from this one, or maybe want to find some. Yeah, we're getting into the end of the conversation, and and I want to hear maybe your thought as an uh, as artist about technology in general. How do you feel technology may be influencing us, or how where do you think technology will go? Because you taking a much more experimental approach with a technology, not necessarily utilitarian approach to technology, and I'm just want to get your thoughts about. What's happening today with technology and society? I, I think with this co coronavirus and everything, I have like two feelings. One, I think that it's 
Actually, the future is non-technological at all. <laughs> Planes will, will stop. The, I think the internet maybe also will stop and we will go back to just staying very close, moving like we, our grandparents used to live. Sometimes I have this, this feeling that, that this, is, this era that we're experimenting, it's, it will last. For example, yeah, we talk, I remember talking with Neil that 3D printing, no, 3D printing is, I think, the most revolution thing that that exists, no, that you can 3D print everything. Uh, so the way that we build, uh, we do things, it's it, it's this is actually will change how we how we interact every day. And then yeah, and then the other way is that. I guess that it will be that the people won't have phones in their hands, that it will be much more, everything will be much more robotic, I guess. Yeah, two weeks ago, actually, we hosted in our podcast, the creative director of Stratasys is one of the leader market in 3D printing, and they have a program that work with artists in order to explore the future of 3D printing. And actually, from a project that they have with the designer, I think they actually develop a new technology that allow them now to print organs. So now they are working on developing new organs. So yeah, I totally uh, think there is a lot of potential over there. So for you, Moon, two, two things about technology in society. One, maybe we are eliminating technology and going back to living a more simple life or more human to human, a life which, by the way, I very connect to what you are saying. And the second part is that we have a lot of what to expect from 3D printing. Manel, what are your thoughts about the... Uh, Technology, society, the future. Yeah, I guess the, there exists like lots of futures in this way. Like we can see the both paths that Moon described. I think that like side that grows, no, it's like it creates the, the, the same thing to the other. No, because in the end it's the same coin, let's say different different sides. But yeah, I imagine more like a future where if we can go out home, like I think as this pandemic, I guess we have to get ready for future ones, you know, and it's like I imagine that maybe there will be one day that we have to spend a year or like long, you know, or more in inside our houses in the other way of going out would be like virtually and meeting your friends like in a virtual room while you're standing you know like or laying in your in your bedroom so i guess we're moving more into a technological world i think also like considering the history like we've been doing this and i guess this will still happen, you know, <laughs> because it's like since we started like the creating the knife and all this stuff, it, this was already, you know, like a modification of what well, I don't know, like like a kind of creating technologies or you know tools uh, to to survive or to to whatever. And we have technology nowadays, and I think we'll start exploring <laughs> with the, the technologies and being more yeah involved with them. So, also, I yeah. think the, the hippies long life to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it is also like this thing that everything changes very fast, which which they they do. They it's very different when I grew up that now, but but sometimes I think society also takes a long time to to accept things because yeah. you know, I remember like the first time and you know, had the, the antenna it was so obvious we thought wow in five years everything and it's still 15 years later and now people are doing conferences of outside but it's like we have the feeling that everything will be very different maybe i have this idea that everything will be very different but actually it won't be that different you know yeah. like sometimes i have this thing maybe for my grandchildren will be very different from my my children but in i don't know in our lifetime i'm not, I'm not sure yeah, I think that, you know, you know, at the end, human basics, uh, love, desire, hate, anger are the same feelings we had five or six or seven thousand years ago. And most likely we will have also in the future. At the end, I think that humans are humans. We respond to things maybe differently in different uh, periods. Guys, I want to say big thanks for uh, taking the time and sharing your uh, thoughts, uh, talking about uh, the different challenges, opportunities. 
I definitely enjoy it. I hope you enjoy it as well. So any last thoughts or message you would like to the listeners <laughs> to get something inspirational? I, I, I usually, it's how I, I end up, not that sometimes like the, the decision of how to use technology, it's ours. It's, I think, uh, so does we feel that uh, uh, some, everyone else is designed for you. And I think it's important to, to take responsibility and you are the one who decides how, you, how to use this technology and to use what you have around. Yeah, and I think that uh, for the listeners, I think that the people doesn't need to be afraid of technology, you know, and the, the cyborg future, because in the end, we're very like, we've watched, like society have to watch a lot of sci-fi movies. And actually it's not that, like, not that way at all. You know, we are not terminators. <laughs> we are coming <laughs> to the world, you know, and it, you know, in the end, it's like each one, I, I think will have the, the freedom to decide if they want to become cyborgs to unite with technology or, or not. And I think just to end like, yeah, that maybe to meet us today could be like an example that how diversity is growing, no? And I, yeah, and how we have to respect this diversity that is coming because it's not, you know, it's just different. We'll grow the diversity of the planet, yeah. And I think with this optimistic message, we will end. Moon, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Manel, thank, thank you very much for uh, uh, you your so time. Much. And stay tuned for our next uh, episode. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. We are producing our podcast without any ads. And we are relaying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so, and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.theartian.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, and you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.